if every Pac-12 football coach was a Top Gun pilot, what would their call signs be? Let's find out. Our Locked On Pac-12, your daily podcast on the Pac-12 Conference. It's the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Locked on Pac-12. I'm your host, Spencer McLaughlin, D1 play-by-play broadcaster. Thanks for making this your first, your first listen or your first view if you're watching on YouTube every day, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your number one source to stay up to date with the Conference of Champions. Like, comment, subscribe wherever you're listening to or watching the show so you don't miss any of the content that we're putting out here at the Locked on Network. And, uh, yeah, this is a fun segment. I enjoy doing these sorts of fun segments, and I love listener and fan engagement as well. There's a bunch of different ways to do that. You can tweet with the hashtag AskLOP12. You can hop in the YouTube comments, or you can hit me up on Twitter at Smalls underscore 55 or at LO underscore Pac-12. And today's fun segment comes courtesy of Tony Altimore, who is at TJ Altimore on Twitter. And he said, what would each coach's call sign be? from Top Gun. Now, for those of you that haven't seen Top Gun, not sure what you're doing with your life, but you should make a different adjust or you should make an adjustment in that sense. The first Top Gun came out in 1986, I think I think 1986 ish somewhere around there, maybe 1984, someone in the YouTube comments can correct me there. The uh, most recent one has been teased for a couple of years because it got delayed and he only wanted to do it in theaters, he being Tom Cruise. I'll just say Top Gun Maverick is unbelievably good and is now the gold standard for sequels. It was flawless. <laughs> it, was, it was basically a flawless movie. So I thought this would be fun. So if you haven't seen the movie, uh, what you know, it's about Top Gun Air Force pilots and they all have call signs, right? So there's their actual name, but like Top Gun Maverick, Maverick is the main character. The actual character's name is Pete Mitchell, portrayed by Tom Cruise, but his call sign is Maverick. So if each coach had a call sign, what would it be? We start with Lincoln Riley. This was an easy one. He'd be Flash. He's all about the offense, all about the big explosive plays. He goes to a team. He's calling the offense, and you are going to have some flashy plays. I think that one is is pretty straightforward, right? And the other thing about a call sign is it's got to be quick. It can't be, you know, like the... The, the king of explosive plays like that's not a call sign. It's got to be something that you can rattle off to maybe three syllables tops. But but mostly two is where I'm where I'm going to keep these uh, Chip Kelly, his Los Angeles counterpart, I think could have one of two call signs. Now, one of them is a name that was given to him in a, in a sense by Brent Musburger back in 2010 when Oregon was in the national championship game. And he just he, or he uh, declared him a riverboat gambler. And that's pretty much what Chip was back in the day. He was going for it on fourth down a lot. There were plenty of trick plays that Oregon ran. So riverboat could be one. But then I got to thinking about it. I was like, well, is that really part of his identity now? He still goes for it on, on fourth down. But does he have that sort of feel, that sort of moxie about him? Maybe a little, but it's not quite as strong. So then I was trying to think. And I came up with glory because I think Chip Kelly is, while also moving his offenses forward and not doing exactly what he did at Oregon, is also trying to recapture the magic that he had back when he was with the Ducks from, from 2009 to 2012, right? With that amazing run where he won 10 games every year, four straight BCS appearances, national championship game, two BCS wins. He's trying to get back to, you know, kind of what he once was, and UCLA is hoping he can. So either Riverboat or Glory. I, I like Riverboat more, but Glory might be a little bit more uh, more accurate. Uh, speaking of the Ducks, Dan Lanning, and, I, you know, I, I paired these up uh, in terms of the order I'm going with, just in, in terms of rivals, right? Because one head coach, the other head coach, yada, yada. So uh, Dan Lanning, I think his call sign would be Smiles. Every time I see him, he's always smiling. He, he's just one of those guys. He's just upbeat. You could come up with something, uh, you know, surrounding the the energy that he's got. There's a video out there of him when when Oregon got Josh Connerly to commit, where he's just going absolutely berserk and he's just thrilled. And he's like, yeah, you know. But every time I see him, 
kind of looks like he's he's smiling. I, it even seems sometimes when he's asked a question where he needs to give a more serious answer, he has to like hold his smile back because he seems to just love what he does. And, and if you know the backstory of Dan Lanning, you know that that's exactly how he is. So Dan Lanning is uh, is smiles because he's just always smiling. His uh, Oregon counterpart, Jonathan Smith, is stealth man. He does everything quietly, and that's compounded by the fact that he's at Oregon State, which is not a flashy program, doesn't have a huge history. They've had successful runs, to be sure, but his teams, as we learned, or as several teams uh, and programs learned a season ago, can be pretty lethal and pretty darn effective. They beat Utah, the Pac-12 champions. Uh, Jonathan Smith beat Mario Cristobal in Oregon in 2020 head-to-head. -head. And so they're just kind of slowly coming up from you know what they were when he took over the program in, I think it was 2018, when it was just, it had completely bottomed out. But he does everything quietly. There's no noise. There's no flash. There's no nothing like that. So Jonathan Smith is a stealth man, kind of like Iceman. Uh, which uh, might come up a little bit later in the show for those of you Top Gun fans out there. Let's go up north to the great state of Washington and the Huskies' new coach, Kalen DeBoer. I was thinking this is actually the hardest one. I, I was trying to come up with it, and I just it, it took me a couple days, frankly. That's how much time that I do really put into these segments. So if you ever send me a question, just know I'm going to give it the full run through, especially if it's a, a fun topic idea like this. I think Kalen DeBoer's call sign would be rookie. Not just because he's new to the conference, but he's pretty new to coaching. For those of you who don't know, I'll ask a question that obviously you can't answer, but you can kind of answer to yourself, and then I'll give you the actual answer. How many for how many years was Kalen DeBoer the head coach at Fresno State? Yet the answer is two. He's only been a head coach for two seasons, so his third year as a head coach ever, ever is going to be at watch, And I just didn't know that about it. I, I thought he'd been a head coach for more years than that. I thought he'd had a stop prior to Washington, but he did not as a head, or prior to Fresno State, rather, but he did not. So I, I give him the uh, denomination of rookie. Though that could also be applicable to Dan Lanning, who is a first-time head coach. Jake Dickert at Washington State. Now, if you saw the original Top Gun movie back in the 1980s, which is a phenomenal film and my mom's favorite movie, by the way. So if she's listening out there, she's probably really enjoying this segment. Um, if you saw the first one, then you know exactly why this makes sense, but I will explain it nevertheless. Jake Dickert's call sign would, in fact, be Cougar. Because in the first Top Gun movie, there is a pilot named Cougar who realizes that he is not tough enough to to be in Top Gun, to be in the Air Force. He can't do it, misses his family too much. So his, his fatal flaw as a character, so to speak, is that he cares too much. And when I watch Jake Dickert talk, I don't think it's a bad thing at all, but I just think the association was too good for, for me to pass up when talking about his call sign. He cares. He loves Washington State, and he really cares. And I think it all started when he named himself the interviewing head coach, not the acting or the interim head coach because that's a guy who you know clearly wanted the job but i never get the sense that he wanted it for for selfish reasons right and it's not always bad to be selfish by the way looking out for your own self-interest is something we all need to do from time to time but i never felt that he wanted it for for that reason i and every time i watch him talk he just he loves washington state i think he embodies what what the school is about really well and he just he's just got this glowing passion for for the Palouse up there in Pullman, so I, I think Cougar is indeed the uh, the appropriate call sign there for for Jake Dickert at Washington State. What about everybody else? What about the Arizona schools? What about the other California schools? What about Kyle Whittingham at Utah? I'll tell you all of their call signs after I remind you. Bet Online is your number one source for all your betting stats and sports info. Find all the latest sports developments, news, and odds, including this year's basketball championship matchup in the NBA with the Warriors and the Celtics, NHL Hockey Conference Finals, Major League Baseball, go Mariners, and of course, all the latest fighting news from MMA and UFC to boxing. Bet Online is your continued source for all your sports wagering information from live betting to playoffs, esports, and more. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action. Bet Online is where the game starts. All right, let's continue with our call signs. So Jed Fish down at Arizona, who I did a coaching evaluation for not long ago, and I think he's off to a pretty good start. Though game management, that's got to, I think that's the biggest area where he's got to improve. But 
I think right now the call sign that embodies what he is to that Arizona football program and kind of how we view him as Pac-12 fans is bright side. Because he's got to always be looking on the bright side, <laughs> right? He came into a program that had lost 12 consecutive games. It had been over a calendar year since they had won. And when you're coming into a situation like that, you have to be able to look on the bright side. And he has clearly done that and has turned that into off-season recruiting and transfer portal momentum where they're top 30 in the country in both this year after a 1-11 and season. So you got to be optimistic there. And, you know, you could go in the route of like Mr. Optimism with, with that sort of mantra, but that's too long for a call sign, right? I said two syllables, m maybe three if it's kind of a quick or easy three, but really two is the way to go. So I, I think I think bright side is the call sign there for uh, for Jed Fish. Herm Edwards, though. A lot of directions I could have gone with, with this one for the Sun Devils head coach. I ended up with big deal. And the the exact verbiage that I'm going for here is for those of you Star Wars fans out there. And, yeah, I'm a big pop culture reference guy. You'll hear me do that pretty often if you haven't already. In Star Wars, The Force Awakens, Han Solo, before he's killed for no reason whatsoever. Gosh, that movie was not very good, but somehow better than the other two sequels. He is referring to Finn, who is, you know, a, a former stormtrooper, but sells himself as a big deal in the resistance. He, Han Solo, calls Finn big deal, but says it in kind of like a half endearing but half mocking way. And I think Herm Edwards is someone who has the resume where he's coming from the NFL and he's had all this experience and he's been around for, for a while. I think that's kind of what, what he is, right? And it's sort of how he carries himself. And it's not necessarily a, a bad thing. I, I think that if you have that sort of pedigree and you're going to sell it to recruits, you're going to sell it to your program and players, then you got to act like that a little way. But I, I think of him as Finn from uh, Finn from Star Wars. Refer to him as big deal. He, he sort of is, but not as much as he or others would perhaps like him to be. Let's go back to the state of California and hit up uh, Justin Wilcox up at Cal. I, uh, Again, a, a tough one here. You know, Stealth Man also could could apply here the same way Jonathan Smith uh, received that name. You know, Wilcox just kind of moves in silence, right? Just kind of goes about his business, does what he does. But I think an important consideration here is the fact that he has stayed loyal to Cal. So his call sign is lockdown. He was offered the Oregon job, which unquestionably is a better job than Cal. I don't know all the details of that situation or why he turned it down, but I know that Justin Wilcox was offered the Oregon head coaching job before Dan Lanning, and he said no and decided to stay at Cal Berkeley. So somehow, some way, the Bears have been able to lock him down as their head coach, though might need to show something this year that leads them to believe he, he's the right guy there. But Staying locked down at Cal Berkeley. And the other reason I think this is very appropriate for Justin Wilcox's call sign is his defenses are always pretty darn good. And his secondaries are always pretty darn good. And so it's kind of the side of the ball. Not kind of. It is the side of the ball where Cal ha has made whatever money they have in the last few years with Wilcox as their head coach. And they've had some really good defenses. And the stats back that up. And their secondaries are phenomenally well coached. He was a former defensive back uh, at uh, at Oregon back in the day himself and he coaches that side of the ball very very well so Justin Wilcox is locked out uh, what about David Shaw this one is um, it, 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 it's tough this is the longest call sign you, you could if you, if you really had to get it down to two syllables you would just go with steady I liked steady Eddie because it can kind of roll off the tongue right it's not a traditional four syllable word or phrase it, it can get off smooth enough, you know, if you were in that, uh, if you were in that environment, right, the Top Gun Air Force, you know, you're in a dogfight up there and you say, Steady Eddie, you got to do this, right? You, you just kind of let it roll together. But aside from the last three seasons, that's what he has been for, for the Stanford football program. And I talked about that in his evaluation on a recent episode. Check it out on YouTube if you haven't already. I've cut up separately all the coaching evals if you haven't seen them and i'm continuing with one later today that will be uh the next coach that i'll go to but i think that you know david shaw has just been so consistent and he's also a very consistent person right he is the same he is the same guy from a personality standpoint from a philosophical standpoint from a coaching standpoint he's the same guy that he was 
when he got the Stanford job in uh, in 2011. And I, I think that that's, um, you know, we'll see if he can maintain his nickname, because if you have three losing seasons in the last four rather than two in the last three with a, a COVID year breaking it up and kind of, you know, making things a little bit weird, then this this call sign might have to change. But for now, David Shaw is is steady, Eddie. Let's go to uh, the final two. Carl Durrell, who's coaching evaluation I will be doing here once I finish up all the Pac-12 call signs. His uh, his call sign is Big Q. His call sign is Big Q for a couple of reasons. Because I think there's a big question about him and whether or not he's the right guy for the Colorado football program. The early returns are okay-ish, but there are a lot of things that are not particularly great. Again, that's coming up in uh, in just a moment here. But the other thing, and this is an unfortunate reality of being at Colorado, I think a lot of people, if they saw a picture of him, w- would probably question who he is. Now, Pac-12 fans might know the, the name Carl Durrell, but you might not know what he looks like because you don't see him a whole lot because Colorado is not one of the bigger programs. Whereas you see Lincoln Riley's face, you see Chip Kelly's, or you know maybe even Dan Lanning's, you know exactly who it is, but I, I don't think Carl Durrell is one of the most public figures that you have uh, in the Pac-12 coaching ring. So he is uh, he's big Q. His uh, Rocky Mountain counterpart, though, is Kyle Whittingham. And his call sign, it's Rocky. Because it has to be. What is more steady or sturdy than Kyle Whittingham at Utah? 18 seasons with the Utes. All 11 that they've been in the Pac-12. The guy's just as rock solid of a head coach as there is in college football. That, that again, uh, or that alongside USC's Lincoln Riley, I think was kind of the, the easiest ones. Lincoln Riley's flash. Kyle Whittingham is Rocky. That would 100% be his call sign. He's only had two seasons under 500 during his tenure with the Utes, and those were five and seven campaigns. If Arizona went five and seven this year, they might give Jed Fish an extension. <laughs> I'm, I'm serious. They, they might. So, not bad for a guy who's been with the same school his entire head coaching career. And um, I'm pretty sure, I think the year he first got there, it was around the time we landed on the moon. Yeah, I think that's about how long he's been at, at, at Utah. So just to recap, Kyle Whittingham, his call sign is Rocky. Carl Durrell, Big Q. David Shaw, Steady Eddie. Justin Wilcox, Lockdown. Herm Edwards, Big Deal. Jed Fish, Bright Side. Jake Dickert, Cougar. Kalen DeBoer, Rookie. Jonathan Smith, Stealth Man, Dan Lanning, Smiles, Chip Kelly, we'll go with Glory, and Lincoln Riley is Flash. Those are your 2022 Pac-12 football coaching call signs. I had so much fun doing that. If you ever want to send in a question like that, again, hashtag ask LO underscore or hashtag LOP12 or DM me at smalls underscore 55 or at LO underscore pack 12 and i will respond to both and you send me any question like that i'll give it the full run through because i just have a lot of fun doing that sort of stuff okay let's move to our carl durrell evaluation here and he has one of the toughest jobs maybe the toughest job in the conference i think the other one that's close is cal I would say Arizona is above both of them, even though in the last few years, Arizona has been a worse football program. Excuse me. I think that if you're talking about the job that it is from a head coach's perspective, you have to factor in, you know, the amount of money, the history of the program, recruiting potential, what state you're in. I think Cal and Arizona both are easier to be at than Colorado. I, I really think it's the toughest job in the Pac-12, but so far, it's 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 not going particularly well. Now, the early returns for Carl Durrell were really good. He's only been there for two seasons, really one and a half, because one of them was 2020, and what even was that? But uh, it's all we've got to go off here with, with Durrell, so we're going to go with uh, one and a half seasons. But he's 8-10 and 10 in his tenure with the Buffaloes, which for Colorado is not a bad stretch. Like It's not great. I'm sure they would like to do more, but 8-10, and 10, it's not it's not disastrous. In that shortened season, they were four and two. They did lose 55 to 23 in the Alamo Bowl to Texas. And in classic Colorado fashion, they started four and oh and then lost their last two games of the year to uh, Utah and then to Texas in the bowl game. But overall, right now, I give Carl Durrell a C minus, which is below average. And the reason that I give him that grade, despite being at such a tough job, 
is if he had these sorts of results or the program was in the state that it is at, you know, in Arizona or a cow, then I would probably give out my first uh, my first D plus or a D for for an overall head coaching grade. But I'll keep him just slightly below average again. C is average here. I'm not these modern high school teachers and professors. I don't hand out A's and B's. You got to you got to earn it in my book. And I think that's what we should do in school. But that's a separate conversation. So let's start with the recruiting. C minus in three years. He's only gotten four recruits that are four stars. Now, is it hard in Colorado? Yes. You don't have a bunch of talent in your backyard and it's not the sort of program that's very easily going to be able to go into other states and, and pluck out, you know, pretty highly rated recruits from a Texas or a California or even like an Arizona or Washington. It's just never been that sort of place ever since they joined the PAC 12. I do expect them to be able to get some of those sorts of players. Right. And so you might hear, you know, in two or three full recruiting cycles. Now they've brought in four, four star players, which is a little lower than you would like. If you're a fan of the Buffaloes and trying to see the program build itself up. However, the reason I have the recruiting rank so low, and I thought about going to a D plus here, but I just barely kept it in the C's because of the school where he is at and the, the amount of institutional buying you got from the administration feels a little bit lacking at times is none of those four star recruits are on the roster anymore. Ashad Clayton transferred out to uh, Tulane down in Louisiana edge player, Jason Harris. He ended up at Arizona. Christian Gonzalez this off season went to Oregon and Brendan Rice went to USC. Rice and Gonzalez were probably the two best skill position players outside of Fontenot, the running back who's, who's really, really solid. Those are probably two best skill position players on either side of the ball, um, you know, on, on the perimeter. And they both left to go to the two biggest brands in the Pac-12. So the fact that you're not bringing in that many high caliber players, but you're also having trouble keeping them it is not a great place to be for Colorado's recruiting. It, it's tough. But at some point, you know, if you're going to show that you're a head coach that can win at Colorado or be the guy that they should invest in for several years, you have to show that you can keep those sorts of players. It's one thing to bring them in, but then they come in, have success, and go elsewhere. That That's not a great place to be a, a, as a football program where you just kind of feel like a, a feeder spot for other schools. They also saw Jarek Broussard leave. He went to Michigan State. He thought about going to Oregon, but ended up going to join former Colorado head coach Mel Tucker and, and the Spartans up there in East Lansing. So recruiting at, at Colorado has always been hard because it's not a historically great program and they're not in a great geographical spot. But at some point, you got to be able to bring it up a little bit from from where it is right now. So C minus on recruiting. Uh, I give the game management and scheme. I'll, I'll give that a C. Right. I'll put that right. Right. At average. Uh, you know, last year they were four and eight. They beat Arizona, the Beavs, UW. And I think it was northern Colorado was, was their FCS opponent. And when I was doing these coaching evaluations, I gave Jed Fish a C minus in game management because it was not great at times last year. He wasn't dealing with some very good personnel either. But uh, if, if I gave Jed Fish a C minus and Carl Durrell beat him on Saturday with, you know, kind of similar talent there with those two programs and where they're at with the with the recruiting or at least where they were at that point in time, then I have to put him above that. So I'll go C, may, maybe even a C plus. I mean, four wins is not bad. Beat the B's. And I think Jonathan Smith is really smart. Uh, Washington, of course, was was way down. But, you know, they also lost an Alamo Bowl 55 to 23. So that, that's a testament to your, your coach's ability to prepare you for a big game. And that's not a not a great, great look. And that was in, in 2020. Uh, player development. Again, I'll go C here, average, but I'll go C with room to grow. And, you know, I, I was talking about the recruiting. They never recruit that well. They haven't been embarrassing. So the, the reason that this player development grade can't be better and why I'd say it's a C, but like trending up with a C, I'll, I'll, I'll actually go C plus. I'll, I'll go C plus on, on the player development here because they don't recruit that well, but they've never been terrible. Now this year, I really think they could be. They just, they had so many players leave. There's not a lot of talent on the roster. I don't know if Lewis is the quarterback that's going to be able to win them a, a bunch of games. Maybe it'll end up being JT Shroud. We'll follow that quarterback battle as, as we lead up to the season here, under, under hundred days away, go college football. But, you know, in order for him to have a higher player development grade, he's, he's got to develop a quarterback. So Lewis either needs to make a step or JT Shroud has to, 
you know, become the starter and really start to grow within that role and become a solid quarterback in the Pac-12. But until then, I can't I, I can't put him into the B category there. He's he's definitely someone who's trying to do more with less, right? Like a cow or in Arizona or Washington State, Oregon State as well. I think they're all kind of in that same mold where you're not going to have a bunch of big time recruits and you have to develop super well. But uh, to this point, I, I give him a C plus there because they haven't been a disaster yet. But we'll see how this season plays out. I have very low expectations for Colorado. Finally, the worst area where Carl Durrell is uh, performing as a head coach is his assistant hires. This is a D plus, and I don't hand out a lot of these, but I've handed out a couple. He gets a D plus. So in his entering his third season in Boulder, he is now on his third defensive coordinator. And one of them, Tyson Summers, left Colorado to be the defensive coordinator at Western Kentucky. That's an inferior conference. So it's just not a great situation when you've been a head coach for three years at a place, you're on your third defensive court. That just makes it tough, right? And Durrell, I believe, comes from the defensive side of the ball. So it's maybe not as impactful as having an evolving door or a revolving door of offensive coordinators. But wait for it. He's on his second offensive coordinator. They did a complete overhaul of their assistance in uh, from 2021 because after a 4-2 2020 campaign that showed some promise, they felt as uh, as an organization, they took a step back and, you know, maybe they did or maybe 2020 was just a little bit more of an outlier for for Colorado. But poor performance, heavy turnover. That's a bad combination when you're looking at your assistance here. And, and we'll see if Mike Sanford entering his first year as the OC is able to to elevate their offense from what it was a season ago because it was pretty poor. But he's got to get the quarterback situation figured out first. And, you know, it's just been hasn't been all bad. You know, eight and ten at Colorado in two years is not it's not a disaster. But I just don't like a lot of the signs that you see coming out of, of Boulder right now. So we'll see how Carl Durrell is able to perform this year. Thanks, everybody, for listening. I will say wonderful rest of your day.